<laughs> How many of you have recently been on a modern jet, commercial jet, like a Boeing Dreamliner or a uh, Airbus? Did you know that these jets have been entirely designed using computer simulations? We trust these airplanes with our lives, but when it comes to our own human health, things are actually quite different. Computer simulations have rarely been used in medicine. In medicine, we have a different approach. It's called trial and error. <laughs> trial and error to make a decision for life-threatening diseases. Today, I want to talk to you about how we in my lab and my collaborators want to change that. We want to bring computer simulation to the clinical practice. So decision, precise decisions can be made about treatments in our case for heart disease. I am a professor of biomedical engineering and medicine, although actually I have neither engineering degree nor MD. I'm actually a physicist by education. Um, but in my lab, we build what we call personalized virtual hearts. Those are computer models of the patient's hearts. So we construct them from the MRI scans of the patient. Now we work mostly with patients who have life-threatening disorders in their heart rhythms. They are called arrhythmias. So we build these virtual hearts with the MRI scans and also with the knowledge that we have of the biology and the physics of the electricity in the heart. And then we use those to predict what would be the best treatment for a given disorder in the patient. Now, you may ask, under what circumstance one would use a virtual heart to make a decision about the patient. Well, imagine the following situation. Um, somebody has a heart attack, they survive it. However, during the crisis, part of the heart muscle has died because it has been deprived of oxygen. So there is scar in the heart, and the scar interferes with the electrical function of the heart, of, with the heartbeat and the patient can suddenly die, unexpectedly and suddenly. For patients like this, the cardiologist will implant a defibrillator in the patient's chest. These are devices very much like the external defibrillators that you have seen in ambulances or emergency rooms. They shock the heart back into rhythm and save the patient's life. Now, how would a doctor make a decision whether to implant a device. It's not a simple task. The procedure is invasive, but most importantly, it carries numerous risks for the patients. Risk of infections, risks of unexpected, very painful shocks that can occur at any time. Because of that, the decision has to be carefully made. How is this decision made currently? Well, in the clinic, the doctor uses one clinical measurement to make this important decision. It is called ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is the amount of blood that's pumped out of the heart with every heartbeat. So when this number is below 35%, then the patient is considered at risk of dying and a defibrillator will be implanted. Well, turns out this is a very inaccurate predictor of arrhythmia. Why? Because ejection fraction is a number that describes blood flow. It has nothing to do with the electricity of the heart. It's like you have an electrical problem at home, but you call, you call the plumber to fix it. <laughs> so that's the same situation. Because of that, Many patients will get devices that they do not need. As a matter of fact, for one person's life saved by a defibrillator, 20 patients will receive unnecessary devices, which is even worse 
That inaccurate criterion misses many patients that are at risk of sudden cardiac death. And indeed, they will go to die sometimes in the prime of their life. So the situation is actually unacceptable and a change needs to be made. In my lab, we are using these personalized virtual hearts to try to make a better prediction whether a patient will die suddenly of cardiac death and needs a defibrillator to protect them. So we use the virtual hearts, we develop them from the MRI scans, and then we use them to figure out in depth what is the specific rhythm disorder in that patient so we can devise the best treatment. We are able to do that because we can poke and prod and stress out that virtual organ that otherwise you cannot do in a flesh and blood heart that allows us to do this. So we had a clinical study and we used our approach that we call VARP, Virtual Heart Arrhythmia Risk Predictor, to assess whether a group of patients have certain probability of uh, cardiac death and need defibrillators. So what you see here now is 32 virtual hearts. Those are the models of the patient's heart. They have the scarring because they all have survived the heart attack. That's the green and the and, um, yellow. So they look kind of simple, maybe, to you. But each of these hearts is comprised of about 10 million virtual cells. And each of these cells has electrical signals, and they all communicate together to determine the function of the organ. So how do we know whether these virtual hearts will develop an arrhythmia? Well, if an arrhythmia is, exists in the patient's heart, it looks like a tornado, an electrical storm. So using our virtual hearts, we predicted that 22 of these hearts will have an arrhythmia. So the cells in these hearts communicated together and came up with a disturbance of the rhythm. And in 10 of them, we predicted they will not have. Although, by the clinical criterion, they all got defibrillators implanted. So, we believe that with using this approach, we can decrease the number of unnecessary implantation of devices and save human life. We completed that study with the number of patients that we had enrolled in it, and then we finished and did statistical analysis, turned out we were way better than anything out there, better than the ejection fraction, better than any other clinical assessment that has been attempted. So this was the first big victory for our virtual heart approach. I must say it has not been an easy road to get to this point. Science, you may know, is quite messy. But the attempt to bring computational science together with medicine, this is a tricky and long road. And we have met so much disbelief, so much rejection in this path. I remember when I was a young professor and pretty much everything that we submitted for publication, got rejected because we were building the first virtual heart. Nobody believed that we, it will be first possible, and number two, that it would be useful. So we created the wall of shame in my lab, and we would paste every rejected paper, every rejected grant, every rejected abstract. It was pretty full. <laughs> and we would look at that, and instead of discouraging it, us, it actually, it greatly inspired us to fight back, to dig in in what we believe, to get on that path that we, to that vision that we had. And here we are. So if our approach indeed turns out to, is to be better predictor of sudden cardiac death in a large group of patient, patients, of course, then this would be an amazing triumph of what we are trying to do. 
And again, it is the importance is what it will bring to the patient. Prevention of sudden cardiac death and the decrease of an unnecessary implantations. You may ask, what other things are you going to do with these virtual hearts? Well, we are currently working on a very cool approach to cure arrhythmias. Now, curing arrhythmias goes way beyond the implantable defibrillator. The implant implantable defibrillator is a prevention device. It's not a cure. But to cure an arrhythmia, the physician has to find which parts of the heart are actually the rogue ones, the ones that generate electrical signal that cause disturbance in, in the heart. To do that, they, it's really difficult to ask. They have to find where they are, and then they go and burn them out. So they stop disturbing the rhythm. This has to be done carefully because you don't want to burn too much of the heart. So the way it is done currently in the clinic is a catheter is threaded to the patient's heart and then painstakingly navigated, actually, I'm going to go back to the personal heart, and painstakingly navigated to that point that they believe might be. Actually, interrogation of the electrical signals takes a long, long time to find these spots. And it can last up to 12 hours. It is actually carries numerous dangers and complications for the patients. And on top of that, it's not accurate. As a result of that, the patient will receive many unnecessary burns. So we are now using our virtual heart technology to help the physician make a decision where are these spots and to burn them. So we are using the virtual heart approach exactly examining the specific arrhythmia of the patient, and then the simulations determine which is the smallest burn and, or the, and also the least number of burns that need to be done in the patient to terminate all arrhythmias at once. And so we do these calculations and we provide that to the clinicians. And we are now in the clinic sitting there. It's a glass between us and the patient. The patient's right there. And we sit there and we watch the physician navigate the catheter to a model predicted target in the patient's heart. And we sit with these headphones and the physician talks to us and asks us questions and we provide clarifications. It is nerve wracking. It is so scary. But it is also immensely thrilling and fulfilling to be sitting there watching this because we are not these people from the engineering school that are just running super cool models of the heart. No, we are these people who are also in the clinic watching how your model might make a difference in the patient heart. And that is an incredible experience. So should our virtual heart approach become a routine clinical test or routine clinical use? That would be absolutely amazing merger of computational simulations with clinical medicine, something that we have set out to achieve. This road for me, as a personal experience, have been amazing. I always knew I was going to be a scientist. So, I grew up in a science family. I was raised that way. My academic parents put me on an elevator to a science career. And there I was. I became a scientist. But that elevator took me to a truly unexpected place. I would have never imagined I would get to a floor where I will be working directly with physicians making the decisions how to deliver the best care for the patient. I would never have imagined that. It is truly incredible to be able to step out of the elevator and to find a place where complex theory, computer simulations, and clinical practice merge together. Like me, you may not know where your elevators are going to take you to. But 
take a chance, press a button, get out of the elevator, and find out. <laughs>